Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our presentation tonight by Stephen Hill, who will be talking on a very topical subject at the moment, COVID-19 and God. Uh, this is obviously a topic that should interest us. It's affected our lives over the past couple of months and the lives of many worldwide. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say about this. Uh, but to open tonight, we will uh, start with a prayer. Our great God, we are so thankful for all that you've done, us, uh, done for us, all that you've blessed us with. And we're thankful for uh, times like this where we can stop and think about what's really important in our lives. And despite some of these times being, being terrifying um, and uncomfortable, we pray that you will please help us through them and help us especially to be strong and help each other. We ask this prayer in your Son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We now ask uh, Stephen to come forward and talk to us on COVID-19 and God. Thank you, Craig. This evening we're going to run this a little bit like a seminar workshop in the sense that hopefully those of you who would like to follow it on a sheet can do so with getting a copy of this worksheet which hopefully will have come into your email inbox before you see this broadcast. There are gaps in there for you to fill in as we go through. And to give you an idea of the scope of this topic, we're going to look firstly at exactly what is COVID-19, where do diseases in general come from, and we're going to then look at God's hygiene regulations, which is a particularly interesting subject I think you'll find. And examples of where God has sent plagues upon the earth, or parts of it, and then tackle the question, is COVID-19 a sign that Christ's coming is near? And more particularly then, are we in the last days or the latter days or the time of the end? Those are all terms found in our Bibles. And lastly, look at where to next, what's going to happen in the near future. So coming back to number one, firstly, what is COVID-19? It's an unusual name for a disease. Well, the CO part is short for corona, and that means the appearance of a crown, a garland, or a wreath from the Latin corona, or Greek corona, very similar, and it's the word used to describe a solar eclipse. So the light shining around the edge of the moon, as it in fact is that's blocking the sun, is called a corona. And because the virus under a very powerful microscope looks a bit like that, it's called a coronavirus. The VI is simply short for virus. The D is short for disease. And 19 is the two, reference to 2019, the year the virus was first reported, uh, very late last year. So that's where this name comes from. It's more appropriate to use this term than simply coronavirus because there are many, many other coronaviruses that are nowhere near as bad as this one. And what does it do? Well, it affects the lungs and it's kind of like pneumonia. It's, and the other thing that's significant about this virus is it's highly contagious. And the World Health Organization, WHO, declared it a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January and then a pandemic on the 11th of March, 
And you may recall that just a little bit later in March was when our governments brought in very strict controls. Now, there have been other similar viruses. Some of us might remember the term SARS, which is short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. That went for a couple of years, 2002 to 4, resulted in 290 deaths. And another one a little bit later in 2012 called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, resulted in 858 deaths. So let's compare those last few points with the current virus. Particularly in comparison with the flu, um, it has been said in the past, notably by President Trump, that this virus was really just like the flu and not to worry about it. Um, he was quite mistaken in that sense. <clears throat> it turns out that COVID-19 was definitely more deadly over a shorter period of time than the flu. It's much worse than the flu. The flu results in roughly one in every thousand people dying because of it, whereas COVID-19 is anything from four to 15 th deaths per thousand. So it's either four or up to 15 times more deadly than the flu. The other feature of COVID-19 is that it has or results in 20 times more people in hospital than the flu does. And in this time, only heart disease and cancer kills more people than COVID-19. So it's a very, very serious disease. But how do we measure that in reality? Well, first of all, we all heard about the term flattening the curve a month or two ago, and that was based on the idea that if we didn't do much, there would be a lot of deaths very quickly, whereas if we brought controls in, there would be fewer deaths and they would be spread over a longer period. And as of the 3rd of June, when I last looked at the figures, the number of deaths per million people in a country were Belgium 830, which is the worst country in the whole world for the virus and, its, and the death rate. So that's a lot of people in Belgium dying, 830 for every million people. The UK had 587, still very high number. The USA had 321. And so where does Australia fit in? Well, remarkably, only four per million. A huge difference. So one of the obvious points to say straight away is that we are extremely blessed to live in Australia where because of the very early clamp down on people's movements, particularly international travellers and also interstate travellers and other measures, the death rate in Australia has been very, very low. And in South Australia, even lower. Only 2.4 people per million have died in South Australia. So you only have to look at the other numbers and many other countries similarly to realise how horrendous the impact has been and is, have, is still having in other countries. It, it's difficult for us to comprehend the difference, isn't it? So, for example, if we happen to um, know, as many would people in America or in the UK, hundreds of times more people are dying than in Australia and in particular South Australia. And worldwide, um, as of the 3rd of June, there have been 382,000 deaths. Now that's more than e either of the other two viruses that I mentioned a moment back, SARS and MERS. And it's still got some way to go, as we all appreciate, I'm sure. So, the next topic, where do diseases come from? Now, you might 
think that's a silly question in the sense that, well, they're always there, aren't they? So no big surprise as where they come from. But what I want to do is to have us think about us as bodies, our human bodies. What's going on that means that we get affected by various diseases? Well, the fact is we're very imperfect creatures. I came across this quote, which I thought was quite good to make the point. <clears throat> the body is a bundle of such jarring contradictions. For each exquisite heart valve, we have a wisdom tooth. Strands of DNA direct the development of the 10 trillion cells that make up a human adult, but then permit his or her steady deterioration and eventual death. Our immune system can identify and destroy a million kinds of foreign matter, yet many bacteria can still kill us. <coughs> so there's a quite a, a, as it says, a jarring contradiction. The human body is a remarkable thing, but sometimes a very small thing, like a virus, can cause it to, to break down and die. But if you come back to Genesis chapter 1, we discover that when God created humans, that wasn't the case. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them in Genesis 1.27. And clearly, God's not subject to viruses or any other things that would cause him to deteriorate and man was made in his image. And we also have the statement in chapter 1, verse 31, that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And it's pretty obvious that the human bodies now are not very good. They're not bad most of the time, but they're not very good. Something happened. So where did then the various diseases and problems that humans suffer come from. Well, we, we turn over uh, just a little way to read the story of Adam and Eve. We read in Genesis that Adam and Eve disobeyed God and various things happened as a consequence. So in Genesis 3 verse 7, it says, The eyes of both of them were opened, they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So they felt shame. They hadn't before. This is new. This was the first thing. The second thing is, we come down to verse 10. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now I hadn't been afraid before. This is new. Fear had happened. Then in verse 16, particularly in the context of a woman in childbirth, it mentions that in pain you shall bring forth children. So pain is now a new feature in their existence. And finally in verse 19, death. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. So that's clearly showing us that there was a significant change in the human condition, not like it was originally. And we now experience all of those things. And of course included in that is the effect of various diseases, injuries and so on. Now if you come over to the next book in the Bible in Exodus 15, we have an interesting expression that uh, is given about the situation as the Israelites were to leave Egypt. In verse 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. 
So there were particular diseases in Egypt that came about from the various plagues that God brought upon them and which were well known as a problem in Egypt generally. The, the diseases of Egypt were quite well known. And in fact, there's a, a, an amazing description of some of the ways they treat a disease, which I'll show you in a moment. But the other thing in the Old Testament that we read about that was a very common problem was leprosy. So that, that's in Leviticus 13 right through to chapter 14. So there was a time back in the time of Moses when diseases were well understood. A lot of people suffered from them. Sometimes they were brought by God. Sometimes they were just part of experience. And the Egyptians, in their ignorance, really tried to come up with ways of treating various diseases. And here's an example. Treatments involved elements of religious incantations and medications concocted from a variety of substances so noxious as to drive away the demons that the Egyptians believed had brought the illness to the sufferer. Dung from various animals, fat from cats, fly droppings and even cooked mice are just a small selection of the range of remedies the Egyptian doctor could recommend as treatment. Well, it's pretty obvious from that, knowing what we know in our time, that they were largely ineffective. But remarkably, that was not the case with the Israelites. And it wasn't, as we see here, simply that God protected them from the disease, in other words, put some kind of a barrier in front of them to, so they didn't get diseases. It was actually something else. And we read about these in the Old Testament laws that were given to Moses at this time. Now this uh, could take uh, a long time, but I won't do that because we don't have time. Uh, but at each of these points which I'll now show you, I think are fascinating in terms of what we now know about disease. The first thing is that if you had, or a person had a wound in their body and uh, there was um, an impact on the skin and there was a discharge, it might be blood or other stuff coming out of the body, the instructions in Leviticus 15 were, if you can, don't touch that. And if you happen to touch it, make sure you wash your hands. Now this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? We've got social distancing, so we don't touch each other. And we are told regularly, wash your hands. This is not a new idea. This was there back in the Old Testament, in the time of Moses. Here's another one. Waste disposal was to be, the waste was to be buried away from the camp. That's a very sensible and understood today a very wise practice. And the idea of being put in isolation if you had a contagious disease, that is you were quarantined outside the camp for either seven or 14 days. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's exactly what people are told to do today. If a visitor comes from overseas, they have to quarantine for 14 days. That was there back in Leviticus 13 and 14. And if someone died, then obviously they were buried. And if you touched the dead body, which it's not surprising, some people might, then you had to be cleansed or your clothing had to be burnt. And that's mentioned in Numbers and Leviticus. And food and drinking water safety was an important issue for them. So the water, it must not have any contact with the dead. If it did, you are not to use it, not to drink it. And they were told to always use running water, not stagnant water. These are quite remarkable given what we now know. 
And various lifestyles involve disease, particularly sexual relationships outside of marriage. And they were understood and, and told to be unlawful. So all of that, whether the Israelites understood the reasons for those or not, we now understand the reasons for them. With our modern medical knowledge, we understand why those make a lot of sense. And those were based on the principle that diseases were communicable. That is, I could give you a disease by touching you or through uh, coughing at you or whatever process. And those were given to the Israelites 3,400 years ago. At the very time, the Egyptians were using those horrible concoctions to try to treat disease. This could not be more different, remarkably different. And it was only 200 years ago that all of those principles were rediscovered. So for 3,200 years, people just blundered around in the dark, as it were, trying to figure out how to control diseases, but with very little success. So what is interesting, I think, firstly then, is to make it very clear that although diseases exist, the way to handle that was foreseen by God, given to the Israelites to help them avoid the consequences of those diseases. Now God, occasionally we read in the Bible, did send a plague of some disease or, or other, or some other serious uh, impact on people. And we know particularly the case of the ten plagues in the time of Moses in Egypt, just where we were looking at a moment ago. And number six was the plague of boils on the skin, which that picture illustrates. There are a few other examples too. When Korah and others rebelled, a plague was sent in to the camp of the Israelites and those people who rebelled against God died. Another example was um, uh, the Israelites at a town called Peor in Moab in Numbers 25. There was a plague on Israel after David numbered the people in 2 Samuel 24. And there was a plague in Israel when they were attacked by Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah mentions that in chapter 21. So there are some examples clearly where God sent the disease, the plague, the pestilence, whatever term we use. But nearly all cases of plagues and diseases have nothing to do with the judgments of God. They are simply part of the human condition. There are very few, and we've only seen there five examples, very few examples where God specifically sent a disease to judge people because they were more wicked than other people. But that's the exception, not the rule. And in fact, in the New Testament, we won't turn those up, but uh, Jesus talks about this issue a number of times, that disasters that occur of whatever form affect the good and the bad. In fact, the good things affect the good and the bad too, like he mentions that rain falls on the just and the unjust. So most of the time there is no particular picking out of people to either give them something as a blessing or as a cursing. That's a very rare and exceptional case. So in our time, is COVID-19 a sign that Christ's coming is near? Well, we're going to come over to the New Testament now and look at the particular example that, that Jesus himself gives. And we'll pick that up in Matthew 24. And three of the Gospel records record this in, in very similar language. It's a prophecy that Jesus gave 
before he died. It's called the Olivet Prophecy, and that's simply because he was standing on the Mount of Olives when he gave it. And so it's got that name Olivet after the word olive. So there is a reference in this prophecy to a disease similar to COVID-19. There's a reference to pestilence. If you're looking at Matthew 24 in verse 7, it says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So Jesus is forced telling a time when there would be diseases sent by God. And in this case, the word apparently in the Greek means, according to um, the lexicographer Vine, a deadly infectious malady. Very similar, you might think, therefore, to COVID-19. So was Jesus talking about COVID-19 today? Well, we need to understand whether that's the case or not. But he's also, as we just read there, making other references to wars, earthquakes and famines. So there are four things he said would be happening. And if you think about it just for a moment, those four things have been happening all the time, in every generation. Not just from his time, but from the beginning. There's always been diseases, there's always been wars and earthquakes and famines. So... This is a little bit unclear, isn't it, as to whether this is a specific prophecy of our time or not. And the other question we need to ask is, yes, well, they have been around all this time, but are they now worse than in the past? Well, just to give you one example, because we haven't time to look at all of them, earthquakes. Are there more earthquakes today than in the past? Well, the answer is no. If anything, they're decreasing. There's a a graph showing the trend of the number of major earthquakes is actually falling. This is not from some obscure group that are trying to concoct some false information. It's, in fact, from the Institute for Creation Research. If anything, they would be very happy to show that earthquakes were increasing as a sign of Christ's coming. But they are saying, well, the fact is, that is not a sign of Christ's coming. There are not more earthquakes now than there have been in the past. So when we look at all of those four things, whether it's disease, war, earthquakes and famines, it's very, very difficult to prove that any of them are worse in our time than they have always been. So what are these verses talking about? Well, in this chapter there's clear references to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year AD 70, exactly 40 years after Jesus spoke these words. And a good example of that is in verse 2 where he says that there would be no stone left upon another. And that's referring to the stones of the temple, a magnificent building. And he said it would be knocked over and all of the stones of that building would be knocked down onto the ground. And you can see those stones in Jerusalem today and there's no temple. So this is not a prophecy of our time, this is a prophecy very close to the time Jesus spoke them. And we have other examples of this language, of it being his own time. Verse 8, just after saying things like famines, pestilence, earthquakes and so on, these are the beginning of sorrows, he says. So this is not the end, this is just a beginning. From his time onwards, they would begin and go on and on and on for a long time. Luke, in his record, has an additional phrase which makes it even clearer, perhaps. The end will not come immediately. He's saying 
that the end of all things is not going to happen soon after he spoke these words. That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem just 40 years later. And in Matthew 24, verse 15, he refers back to a prophecy recorded in the book of Daniel, which describes, without going into it now, the invasion of the land and the occupation of Jerusalem by people who did not worship the true God. And it's called the abomination of desolation, the end of worship in the temple. And that occurred in the year 70. Luke 21 talks about Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, which it was back in AD 70. And in Luke 21 verse 24, Jesus describes then from that time that Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until some point much later, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So those words about pestilence that we read in verse 7 in their context are referring to his time, not our time. So that verse 7 is not a prophecy that says just before Christ comes, God will send COVID-19 as a prelude to his return. That is not the context. And in fact, there have been many worse pandemics in the past. For example, it's estimated that a plague that went through the Roman Empire in 165 AD, that 5 million people died. In the year 541, it's estimated at least 25 million people died from that plague. In 1347, the Black Death killed somewhere between 75 and 200 million people. And they have dug up mass graves, as you see in that picture, of that time. In 1855, in China, a plague killed 15 million people. And more recently, in 1918, at least 50 million people died from what was called the Spanish flu. Now, this has a a certain personal relevance to me, not because I was alive in 1918, because I wasn't, but my grandfather's first wife died from this flu on their honeymoon. And my grandfather subsequently married another woman who was my mother's mother. So that was an incredibly serious disease in in fairly modern times. So the pandemic that we're going through now, as bad as it is, is not by any means the worst that's ever occurred. So you might think at this point, well, what were you bothered talking about this subject? Well, we do want to understand where we fit in the scheme of things. We, are, we need to appreciate, I believe, the two things that we've, one thing that we've looked at already, two things coming. One is that God has provided very clear advice on how to manage a disease. And that's only fairly recently been figured out by humans on their own efforts, but God had it there all the time. So are we in the last days or the latter days or the time of the end? Well, we have a number of Bible statements using these terms, and here's just a few. In Timothy, it talks about some would depart from the faith. In John, there would be an antichrist. Again, in Timothy, perilous times. In Jude, mockers. In Peter, disbelief, the second coming of Christ. The problem there with those is you might argue they could apply at many different times in history. And that doesn't doesn't prove that we are exactly now in the last days. It may or may not. But there are a number of more specific ones. In Daniel 11, it talks about the king of the south 
pushing at the king of the north. And again, we don't have time to explain this, but I am sure in my mind that looking at that chapter, that's describing the British forces, including Australians, that came from Egypt into the land of Israel and pushed the Ottoman Empire out of that area. That was fulfilled in 1917. So this is a more specific one, which tells us that we're generally in these times, the last days. The most dramatic one of all, though, is the fact that there are a number of statements to make it clear that in the last days there would be a nation of Israel. And that did not exist until 1948. Furthermore, it says that these people would be on the mountains of Israel, which only occurred in 1967 when Israel captured what was called today the West Bank, the mountains of Israel. And there are other prophecies in Zechariah, for example, that talk a similar language. So now we're getting a lot nearer. There's clear indications that we are in the last days. Not very, not the last day necessarily, but we're getting closer. Now I'll draw a line under there because there are a number of other statements in the Bible about the last days, but these haven't happened yet. Now, I put them in a certain order, but they may occur in a different order. That's not the point I'm making. First of all, there's references to the resurrection. Jesus says that he will raise the dead in the last days. In Daniel, again, in chapter 11, the king of the north will push south. That hasn't happened yet, but it's getting very close because Russia has occupied Syria for the last five years. It's right on the border now of Israel and it would take very little for them to just push a bit further south and occupy Israel. So that is certainly a possibility very soon. In Daniel 2 there's a description of a prophecy called the Nebuchadnezzar's image which will stand up Ezekiel 38 describes the invasion of Israel from the north. Acts 2 talks about the Holy Spirit will be poured out, that in Hosea Israel will return to God and in Isaiah and Micah that God's temple will be built in Jerusalem. So there's a few more things to happen in these last days. But you can see we sit right in the middle of that list. All of those that have in the top above that line, have happened. And we're now just waiting for the rest. And it could be very soon. So what is next? What do we expect to happen from our Bibles? Well, there are, coming back to our Olivet prophecy, this time we'll look at Luke's record of it and see what... Jesus said about the time after Jerusalem would be trampled down for a certain period, which was roughly 1,900 years. Luke in chapter 21 verse 25 describes the conditions at the very end, just before Christ comes, as distress of nations with perplexity. Again, you might argue, well, that happens a lot, has happened a lot in the past. Possibly so. But it's certainly true now. Um, Whether it's bushfires that we had last year, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's race riots in America and many, many other problems around the world, there is certainly distress and there's certainly perplexity, literally at a loss for a way. How do we solve these problems? And there seems to be very little idea of how to do that. Jesus goes on and adds a bit more. He says, Men's hearts will fail them for fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth. And there's a lot of fear in the world, even in our country, wondering what's going to come, what's next. 
and people are very worried about it. Daniel describes these last days as a time of trouble such as never was, which really tells us things could get a lot worse. And in Acts 1 verse 11 we have a, a very clear statement by Jesus that he will come back to the earth. He will intervene. God will send him back to stop all of these problems that are occurring and fix the problem. However, the Bible does not say that the end will come by a pandemic. There are no verses that tell us that when you get a disease that does this or affects people here or there or this much, then you'll know Christ is going to come tomorrow. There isn't anything like that. We are told, on the other hand, that Christ will intervene and what he is going to do, what's going to cause him to come. And the key one is to save Israel from destruction. We saw on the previous slide a couple of references to the invasion of Israel. And we're told in those chapters in Ezekiel and Joel, for example, that God will send his son to stop the destruction of Israel. There will certainly be many people die in that invasion, but they will not be annihilated. And at the same time, whether it's before or after, is another subject, he will raise the dead, which we noted earlier. And also he will judge the whole world. And he will establish the kingdom of God on earth. And this will fix all of the problems that we've been looking at. Now, we don't have any time to talk about exactly what this kingdom will be like, but just very quickly to run through some points. It will rejuvenate our planet and our society. There will be a worldwide government with its capital in Jerusalem. Human longevity will be increased. There will be improved food production. Desertification will be reversed. That's referring to deserts, not desserts after dinner. The deserts will be gradually reclaimed and become productive land. There will be a fair system of justice. There will be less sickness. There will be one religion. There will be security. There will be no wars. There will be equity and ultimately no death or pain. So whether we're talking about diseases such as COVID-19 or any of the other myriad of problems that afflict people in this country and around the world, this is the solution. This is what God will do in his good time. And the evidence that we've looked at is that that is probably very near. Thank you. Thanks very much for your words, uh, Stephen. We've seen tonight how God has provided many of the hygiene guidelines that we're actually being implemented today and we've also considered how Jesus's return to uh, the earth will mark the end of troubled times and see a world rejuvenated so thank you again for that Stephen uh, we'll close tonight with a prayer our great God we are so thankful for the hope